Well, when you go into space, the country borders go away, except yeah. for two places. There are two places. You can still see two borders from space. One of them in the daytime, you can see the border of Israel with surrounding deserts because Israel irrigates. And so it's green and the surrounding areas are brown. You can see that from space. Another border, which you can see from space at night, is, of course, North and South Korea right mm, there. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. And that's punched up. I mean, if you were in the dead of night, you don't know the difference between the ocean and the land as the as you, your sight line crosses um, North and South Korea. And so... Uh, so what you and if you look at the GDP per capita differences between Israel and surrounding um, nations and uh, South Korea and North Korea, it's you know factors of eight, nine, ten, twelve. So space can reveal economic inequities in at least those two places, which is itself kind of a stunning fact. Mm. Um, so I, I, I want to tell Elon, you're now neighbors with him, right? Get him back here and say, Elon, build a bus, a space bus. We have an air bus. Why not a space bus? A space bus where you put all the warring leaders and have them send them, send them to the moon, have them look back on Earth. Say, so, you know, we're fighting over that border. We are. Once what? they came back down, I think they'd just go right back to work. <laughs> you think so? I, I just went to the Keck Observatory on Wednesday. Nice. It was Hawaii. Amazing. Yeah. Big I, island. Very nice. I, I, Did you go to the base camp or already at the top? The base camp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went specifically there because I had an experience there um, about, I was six, 17 years ago. I went there and I caught it on a perfect night where the the moon wasn't out and it was phenomenal and the view is so astounding there's so many stars you see the milky way in such clear detail that you have a totally different perspective of the cosmos and it's, you it's, feel it's like sad. you're flying through space with a, a windshield over your head like you're in a spaceship you know there's some other uh, my entire phd thesis involved mountain going uh it's a lost ritual because now we we'd have what's called service observing you just write in what things you want to observe them what nights for how many hours uh -huh. and then they send you back the data there used to be a pilgrimage to the top of a mountain and you live nocturnally and you go to them and be up all night with the yeah. telescope and the universe yeah there's a certain almost spiritual connectivity that that brings upon you when it's just you alone and there are moments that mountains are high up enough so that if clouds roll in you're above the clouds. We were above the clouds. You're above the clouds. Yeah. This is what makes it especially yeah. spooky, magical, mystical, Mount Olympus-like. Because yeah. you're on the top. There's no other land. It's just clouds. So it's you, the tops of clouds, and the universe. Yeah. Communing with the cosmos. It's and, just the view of it is so astounding. And um, many people who go to the go to Australia and say, oh, you got to see the southern skies. What, they're, what they don't know when they say that is any clear sky anywhere in the world will get you that. Yeah. In the southern hemisphere, only 15% of humans live there. So there's essentially no light pollution anywhere there. 85% of all humans in the north... You're hard pressed to find a completely dark sky in the north, leaving you to think that there's something magically beautiful and different about the southern sky. You are observing the northern sky. Um, Hawaii is like 15 degrees north, but so it's a lot of the southern sky as well. Point is, you have the best observing site in the world, which is why they want to put a 30 meter telescope there. And there's some conflict um, with the um, indigenous groups regarding that yeah. and whether the mountain is sacred and in what ways it's sacred yeah. and the like. And so that's still going on last I checked, but I, I'm not surprised and I'm delighted that you had that experience. And now you know how I feel when I look up. Yeah. I, I was baptized in emotionally, psychologically baptized with the night sky in New York City's Hayden Planetarium. Because mm. as a city kid, I, I grew up in the Bronx. We don't have a relationship with the night sky. Right. You know, we might see the moon and an occasional planet, the the setting sun. That's it. Couple you look of up, dots, for stars. Dot, that's it. You see the tall buildings. You yeah. see, back then, there was 
air pollution, um, light pollution. So my first night sky was the Hayden Planetarium. Mm. And to this day, to this that was I was nine years old. To this day, when I go to mountaintops, just as you experience, and I look up, I said to myself, "This is so beautiful." It reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium. That's funny. <laughs> I know that's messed up.